We are live. Welcome to 2021's Hawkeye Review mini series. Yes, this is a review of the Disney Plus mini series, not of any of the pretty decent fan films available for free here on YouTube. Make sure that you watch the existential horror of living in the Marvel Universe, some Marvel news. It is incredible. Just amazing, you know, incredibly good points made about movies that I love. He also did this for Star Wars, where I love some of the movies. Slightly belated Happy New Year. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And I am currently dealing with some back pain, but it's not a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I do also have an intense headache. I swear, I did not stay up forever last night. I t and I did get some sleep, but yeah, just so I'm gonna try not to just completely veg out, even with the yeah. This video is a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. Also, please note I will not warn for sp before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise. If you want my spoiler-filled thoughts on episodes, the link to them will be in the description box. Rather, the link to the playlist that has them, MCU Thoughts. So yes, please note that while I am aware that many people have watched this, sh this miniseries, this review will be based on the idea that you haven't. So if this is the first of these videos by me that you watch, then just to get you up to speed, I love every MCU movie. They're all in the 7 out of 10 to 10 out of 10 range. Or they won't make any excuses for Iron Man 2. And I'm definitely not claiming that a single one of them is 100% absolutely flawless. No movie is. I'm saying that their strengths so greatly outweigh their weaknesses that they deserve such high ratings. And I love every episode that's come out so far of the Disney Plus MCU shows. 10 out of 10 for WandaVision, Captain America the Winter Soldier, Season 1 of Loki, Season 1 of What If, and this. I do want to very briefly address, I realize that there's only one MCU cover standing up there, the rest of them are Spider-Man, and not even MCU Spider-Man. Iron Man 3 is, like, the only MCU movie that I own a copy of, because I have Disney+, Plus. and before Disney+, Plus, I would just, you know, go to the library and, and what's it called, borrow, not lend. Not rent, because that wouldn't mean I was paying money for it, at least. Anyway, the individual movies, so... Yeah, but I, I, st I still wanted something up there. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So, feel free to watch something visual, like clips from the show in another tab. I won't mind. I'll know, but... I mean, I won't know, of course. <laughs> I don't have, like, a secret camera set up that captures really good visual and sound, even though it's recording people who probably don't want to be recorded. And certainly if I did, I'm sure it would have been found and turned off, and that's really why I can't see it right now. So, content warning and or trigger warning. This movie features, uh, mini features some of the following, and I am going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering content. Vigilantism, torture, kidnapping, disability, gaslighting, xenophobia, murder, body horror, and grief and mourning. So I have watched every episode of this once and yeah usually I try to watch the the thing I'm reviewing really close to but I have to admit I have only watched the, the I watched the finale last Wednesday so it has been a little while but it is fresh in my mind. Plot. Clint Barton confronts Kate Bishop, an over-eager 22-year-old who wants to be a hero, taking up his Ronin mantle in New York, only to be dragged into a local dispute. Will he be home in time for Christmas with his kids? There is also 
there, there's a murder mystery. There is a mystery going on about an object. I don't think I'm going to get more specific than that. An object that various parties are interested in. There are some red herrings and, you know, you're trying to figure out what exactly, you know, who is behind what's going on and I think, yeah, and, and what is the significance of the object that multiple characters are trying to, to find. And... Yeah, so I'm going to quote a few fellow critics here. Of all the Disney Plus MCU shows, some have said that this is the one that is the most similar to one of the one of the movies. And And it is very street level. And let's see. yeah, the, this person gave it 60 out of 100. If the plot isn't up to much, what little happens in the first two episodes is erratic and riven with holes that leave you taking a lot on trust and hoping backfill will begin soon. The characters are credible and worth a little more emotional investment than usual. Plot twists make little sense, and loose ends are not tied up. Let's see. And, right. So, how Christmassy is this show? Beware, I am about to say the word Christmas so many times in a row that it's going to start losing its meaning entirely. We are looking at that... Futurama Xmas episode. We have Christmas music, Christmas movies, Christmas sweater, Christmas decorations, Christmas spirit, Christmas mood, Christmas tree. Yes, I, I think that is that that will suffice. And you know something a, a bit of a, a theme on the show is maybe Kit Bishop and Clint Barton will be able to help each other self-actualize. Now, over the course of the show, the the characters try to investigate these mysteries, and I think I will, let's say they engage with the local mob, the tracksuit mafia, which are these Eastern European, you know, uh, yeah, Eastern European walking stereotypes. Now, according to Wikipedia, Jeremy Renner had originally signed on to star in a standalone feature film focused on his character, but agreed to star in a series instead after Feige decided to redevelop the project for Disney+. Plus. I think this works much better for Hawkeye than a movie would, and... I hate to say the following because I do think Black Widow deserved a solo movie, but I do think that it might have made a lot of sense for her solo project to have been a Disney Plus show as well. You know, it really doesn't have enough time to explore the Red Room and the effect it had on all these young women. It, it doesn't have enough time to delve deep into it, and that's something where you know, these Disney Plus shows, they have been able to, to delve into themes better than a number of the movies. But with that said, I definitely do think, you know, um, you know, both of them deserve a movie, but especially, like, Black Widow, the first female Avenger, and she's not even the first to get a solo, the first female hero in the MCU to get a solo movie, and her solo movie you know, comes out several years after the DCEU has their first solo movie for a female hero.
Now, more Wikipedia. When officially announcing the series, Feige and Renner said the series would follow Barton as he teaches Bishop to be a superhero without superpowers and would explore more of Barton's time as the vigilante Ronin than that was first shown in Avengers Endgame. And in October 2019, executive producer Trin Tran said that the series would explore Barton's past and confirmed that the mantle of Hawkeye would be. Let's see. Yeah, I think I'm gonna. Hawkeye is influ influenced by Matt Fraction's and David Aha's run with the character in the comics and adapts some elements. I am a really big fan of the Matt Fraction, David Aha run, and to, you know, admittedly, I only read it because I, you know, I, I read it very recently because I knew that it was going to be. A major part of the yeah that it would in the parts of it would be adapted for this but I fell in love with it on page one like it is just yeah now and and yeah yeah part of that is I, I'm not 100% certain which came first but the very first page of the very first issue of Hawkeye of, of the David Aha Matt Fraction David Aha run on Hawkeye is either it is a reference to the first Avengers movie or the first Avengers movie is referencing it with that particular scene and I think I might leave it at that but that you know that that run I forget which youtuber but what one of my fellow youtubers said that in that series you know Clint Barton is basically a human car crash like it is the the yeah and many of the issues the very first page opens with the words okay this looks bad and indeed a situation that does look bad now Brad Jones friend Sarah I'm afraid I forget her last name thought that Matt Fraction's name meant he was the alter ego of of the hero Math Man which I found too funny not to mention here even though she made that joke in like I want to say the their midnight screenings video on Age of Ultron so yeah it's it's a little while back now some of the elements in from from the Matt Fraction David Aha Hawkeye comics that appear in this are Lucky the Pizza Dog a golden retriever who is a companion to Barton and Bishop the tracksuit mafia and Barton's hearing loss now the Tracksuit Mafia, in the comics, they manage to work the word bro into nearly every single thing they ever say. I love it in the comic. I didn't think... I, I figured that they would probably not have it as a huge element of the miniseries. I guess it's not a huge element, but it definitely... It is a running thing, and I didn't think it would work as well in live action, but they made it work really, really well. Hawkeye, the miniseries, is set in New York City around the Christmas season following the events of Avengers Endgame. With Tran noting that many, but not all, of New York citizens have recu recuperated and continue thriving following the blip. And another fellow critic here, this person gave it a 50 out of 100. The Disney Plus Hawkeye is too beholden to the larger MCU as a guiding narrative force and generic house style filming to truly find its own voice as Fractions Hawkeye once did. That is admitted. There, there is definitely some, some truth to that, yes. Now, in order to follow this miniseries, you do need to have watched everything MCU that deals with Hawkeye. So, Avengers 1, and two, one 2, and 4, Thor 1, Civil War that's them and I'm really glad that's the case because they do a really great job of building on that like hypothetically if this had to introduce Clint Barton from the start it would definitely not be able to delve as deep into his character as this does this really like I, I understand why some people felt disappointed this is the first solo project for Hawkeye in the decade that he has been in the MCU, you know, he literally, 
he is in Thor 1, only very brief, I guess 11 years by now, yeah, because Thor 1 came out in 2010, I'm almost 100% certain it was 2010, not 2011, but yeah, the, not a big deal, moving on, 10 or 11 years he's been in the MCU, and this is the first time he's finally getting a solo project, he was actually, Jeremy Renner was apparently so frustrated with his treatment in the Avengers movie, with the first Avengers movie, which was the first real showcase for the character that he actually tried to get out of the MCU after that and you know as in in somewhat in a, of an effort to make it up to him you know I, I don't know if it was Joss Whedon's decision I don't know exactly who decided it but that's part of why Hawkeye is so important in Age of Ultron and I think that was the right choice I'm really glad he stayed in the MCU now, the, the, but, but yeah, th this can really delve deep into the character. All the other times he's been there in the service of other characters. Now, certainly Endgame does, we do spend some time with him completely, where, where it's only him. But here he has much more time and they, they're able to, to dig deeper, and this is a character, there, there is, you know, I've, I've read some reviews where people said nobody wanted a Hawkeye solo, but I get that some people didn't care, and some people ended up not liking this, but he is, the, you know, there, there are interesting aspects of him, including his past, his grieving over Natasha, so there was going to be spoilers, and I suppose, yeah, he, you know, he's not, he doesn't have the highest opinion of himself, he doesn't really think he's a role model, and yeah, the show explores these things in, in ways that the movies just don't have time for. Even a solo movie wouldn't have had time for it because it'd be jumping from action scene to action scene, which was one of the problems with the Black Widow movie. Now, I would say... I, I would say you could binge this show, although if you do... You know, I, I just want you to know before you get... You know, before you try to watch the first two episodes, it will get better after the first two episodes. The first two episodes, I mean, I think, I think an argument could be made that the first two episodes together make up the pilot. And pilot episodes, you know, it's got to set up so much, all these characters, all these elements of the core plot. And yeah, this, this is not the best MCU Disney Plus show pilot. I, personally, I would say it is more interesting than the, the what if as pilot, but other than that, it might be at the bottom. So let's, I guess at this point, I might as well rate, I would still say WandaVision is at the top. I, I am not sure anything else is going to be able to top that for a while. Moon Knight might. Moon Knight might actually, which is apparently the next one. Really stoked for that one. Yeah, WandaVision is, is at the very top. Captain America the Winter Soldier is the very next one. Then Loki, then this, and finally, what if? And and once again, I, I love all of these episodes. I'm just saying this, you know, if I'm if I'm completely honest and objective about it, this definitely does have, yeah. Now, one of the themes is hero worship, you know, are heroes really who you think that they are? How do regular people try to, like, live vicariously through heroes? You know, there there is this element that some really don't like of 
LARPers or for the uninitiated, which I swear I, I don't LARP. I can't imagine I would ever LARP, but I have known a few LARPers. Live action role playing, which is exactly what it sounds like. You know, people who dress up as, you know, characters from role playing games and go out there with foam swords and yeah you know and yeah some people thought that the show makes too much fun of them I get what they mean it's you know it's sadly like it is kind of really it is kind of silly because it's a major like it's you know I, I don't know exactly what the budget was but they must have spent at least a few million on this and it's based on comic books so I don't know where they're getting off making fun of LARPers but you know, it, it's mainstream culture often makes fun of kind of niche nerd culture, and that's sadly also the case here. But the show does use that. It's not just making fun of them. It is exploring how LARPing is a way for normal people to feel like heroes. And it also, you know, Clint himself is very uncomfortable being worshipped and you know especially right after they meet Kate is really like she she can hardly believe she actually met Clint Barton Hawkeye in real life you know she is just completely geeking out over him and he's extremely uncomfortable with it which is very very funny and just yeah in in general yeah hero worship is a major theme and yeah, the, the show does a really good job exploring that. Now, the writing. This was written by Jonathan Igla, who has a number of other TV credits. Tanner Bean also has other TV credits, not all as a writer. Katrina Mathewson, again, other TV credits. Right, that appears to be all of them. Now, yes, so quoting a few fellow critics here. Adapting Matt Fraction and David Aha's character-defining run of Hawkeye is no easy feat. In the new Disney Plus series, it's clear that Marvel understands the assignment. Now, this person gave it a 6 out of 10. So one thing has been said extremely clear with the Marvel series, they really don't know how to balance innovation and their traditional formula. So, yeah, just like WandaVision, Hawkeye starts quite fun with some intriguing moments. The show embraces the Christmas series genre in the initial episodes. It loses the funny holiday tone of the narrative progressively, even though the show tries to demonstrate that not every cinematographic history of superheroes needs to be self-serious in the first episodes, this feature is forgotten as they introduce new really dangerous characters. Moreover, Marvel needs to create a decent script for funny moments. It gets really cheesy here and there. The series would work better as an adult drama with a proper grim Hawkeye and feel Jeremy Renner is begging for it, but Haley Steinfeld's character turns the show into something so Disney Channel it's painful. When she gets her own show, it will just be the Hannah Montana of Crosspoint. And that's fine, because there is an audience for that, but Hawkeye is stretched between two vibes, and none are working. He should be a rough loner a la Wolverine, not some co-parenting vigilante. And I 100% respect that point of view, but I do disagree. I, I Honestly, I haven't watched very much Disney Channel, or or... Did I when I was a kid? I honestly don't remember at all, but I I've seen like people making fun of it, so I've seen brief clips in videos and such. There's definitely at least some truth to that. I don't think that this should have been like just, you know, Wolverine. That I I I do think that it makes a lot of sense to do you know the the 
the tone in a number of ways is very similar to the Matt Fraction, David Aha run on the comics. And I think that was the right choice. Now, plot twists. The show is a little mixed on this. Some of the plot twists, like, there were a few elements. I watched this as it was released, one episode per week. There were elements that I almost forgot were in the show because a while would pass without them being brought up, being, you know, like, it, it felt like the show, the, the writers knew that this was going to be important down the line, but they didn't think about that the audience would need to, you know, we'd need some follow-up. You know, the, some stuff is shown in, like, the first episode, and then it doesn't really come into play for several more episodes. And, yeah, it just... But at the same time, some of them were very effective. Some of them were really, like, gut-punch, jaw-dropping kind of stuff. And the... I, I would say largely the handling of plot twists is good to great, but there are a few where it is like... Yeah, it, it, they, they needed to remind us of this stuff. They needed something to happen with it sooner. But yeah, there. I would say there are not too many or too few plot twists. And I don't think any of them are outright bad. They're just a few where it is, like, you know, some something would be introduced early on. And then in a later episode, it would show up again, and it was supposed to be like a plot twist. But because we had kind of forgotten, because they didn't really go into... In, you know, in the in-between, we had to, like, think back. Oh, right, there's that thing. Okay, yeah. Now, the pilot, it's good. It's not great. It is slightly meandering. It sets up a lot of things. And some of the things that it sets up, you know, when you look back, it is a little, like, some of it, it feels like if that was all they were going to do with that, they didn't, they at least didn't need to spend as much time and effort setting it up. A, a little too much time, a, a little too many episodes pass sometimes between, it, yeah, before major characters are introduced that, you know, that, that make a really, that, that have a really strong impact on the plot. And so it feels like, why didn't they show up sooner? Now, as a finale, it is good, not great. Or the, yeah, the show's finale. And yeah, so let's see. Yeah, quoting some fellow critics here. Speaking of the finale, it wasn't great. Unfortunately, this show bats 0 for 4 in terms of finales. This finale was the best, although it was very bland and anticlimactic, in my opinion. One problem that Marvel live-action shows had so far is that it starts strong but ends weak. Thankfully, this is not the case. In Hawkeye, as its final episode, is wonderful and is a great ending to the show. However, the first two episodes are quite slow. It is mostly spent on building up Kate's character, setting up the mysteries that the show will revolve around. The thing is that it the thing is that it takes a long time for it to build this up and there isn't much excitement happening. Clint is barely involved in some of it. And this causes the show to feel like the Kate Bishop show rather than Beth Clint. Issues such as action may feel like the Kate show is fixed in episode three onwards. Now
yeah, there's definitely some some things in the in the finale that could have been better, and yeah, the the MCU does have a show finale problem. Wait. Did they say 0 for 4? There's only been three series finales. WandaVision, Captain America, and Hawkeye are the only shows where we've, by this point in time, seen all. Yeah, I don't know. Some people seem to think that Loki and or What If have already had their full run. There's at least one more season coming of each of those. Anyway. But yeah, the the, the finales, they, they... In some ways, these shows are getting better. But they do have a problem with their finales, and it is definitely still an issue in this show. They do try to wrap up everything and to make sure that everything has a conclusion, as much of a conclusion as these, you know, we know that a lot of these characters are going to show up down the line, and, you know, stuff that's introduced in this might show up in later MCU stuff, but they they do a pretty decent job of wrapping up, of, of making sure to wrap up everything, but some of the things they don't really, like, like, I can look at it, I can point to it and say, okay, technically that was wrapped up. Like, what there was, what what was set up, was technically addressed. Like, by the end, when the end credits run on the final episode, everything the show brought up has been in some way addressed. But some of it, in the finale, it's not, like, it's just... Like, they, they even, for some of it, they even bring up, like, they're like, oh, well, isn't that... Huh, I guess, I wonder what's going on there. And then, like, it gets a few more minutes of screen time, and it's like, okay, technically, that did wrap it up. That's definitive closure on that. But it didn't spend that long on it. And it is the kind of thing where, yeah, some of this stuff, it feels like if they... If the wrap-up of it was going to be that quick and that... kind of average then they didn't need to spend that much time on it in the other episodes. So this is quite a, a quite a strong adaptation. You know, I forget exact the exact number, but I want to say it's like 24 issues of the comic, six episodes of a miniseries. Like if they were if they tried to do a direct adaptation, it would probably be 20 to 30 minutes per issue of the sh of the comic. So, given that this show is not 12 hours long... Uh... Wait, did I, I did say 20 to 30. Yeah, 12 hours long. It is not the entire comic. And there's also, like, there's stuff in the comic that really wouldn't fit for this show. I think they made the right choices in what to bring in and what to leave out. Some of the stuff really wouldn't work well for the show. Some of it requires a lot of setup that, like, if you were reading the comics, you'd know this stuff, you know. But if you're just, like, a lot of the, th the things that show up in the comic are things that haven't been introduced in the MCU yet and might not be at all. So, they can't really just bring in all of this stuff. And I'm, I continue to really appreci appreciate that the MCU does not try to do direct adaptations pretty much at all. Like, they always pick and choose elements and do their own spin on things. And I would say they continue to do that here. The... There, there are things in, in the comic that really would not work for this miniseries, and I really appreciate that they just 
don't even like try so they they are just it's it's only the things that they feel work you know a, a quick example would be that literally this miniseries is set close to christmas and in the comic yeah there's there some of the story is set new close to christmas but not all of it and just yeah the 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 comic is set over a longer period of time and with more like some of some of the story strands don't it's hard to go into it without spoiling too much but yes some stuff shows up in the comic that is related to what's going on in the the other comics at the time and just yeah would not work for for this miniseries the show does a good job with fan service there's there's a lot of references but without it being like just it's not just this constant barrage of um references and such now so the the um, this of course has trick arrows and like ridiculous accuracy and i think yeah i'm i'm brief somewhat spoilers other like powers and and abilities include the ability to mimic others movements and and detect their weaknesses based on the way they move and and such and yeah that's gonna be it no more spoilers for the time being and yeah it does a really good job with them like they're you know if, if you are a fan of Hawkeye's trick arrows this is the show for you like not every single episode will have a lot in it but yeah overall there's there's some really really fun stuff with trick arrows in this so the direction was handled by the duo Bert and Bertie who have directed shorts and let's see, a couple of movies and some other TV than this and apparently Birdie, but not Bert, helped write the story for Just Cause 3. So that's, yeah, that's very cool. They're quite good. They, you know, so, so far, each of these, I, I believe each of these Disney Plus MCU shows have used TV directors rather than movie directors. And it seems like it's it's working well like you know the the pacing for a tv show just is very different than a movie you know there there are a couple of exceptions i want to say it was Enterpri star trek enterprise season 4 had some stuff where it was like two episodes would of of 40 minute you know plot would go together to make an 80 minute movie kind of so so for that you know exception but by and large you know each episode is going to be shorter than a movie and you need the story to stretch for multiple of of these you know like by definition a miniseries is longer than a movie and is episodic now Quoting some from Wikipedia. In July 2020, Reese Thomas was hired to direct a block of episodes for the series and serve as an executive producer, with filmmaking duo Bert and Bertie hired to direct another block. Bruce Kitt at The Hollywood Reporter felt hiring these directors indicated the series could have a light-hearted tone given the past work of each. And yeah, for, for sure that is, you know, when you look at the stuff they've they've done, it is and I would say that, you know, they did in fact bring that to the show and they, 
it, it works really well. Like, this is a much lighter show than, you know, Captain America and the Winter Soldier, for example, which was very, you know, it's it's politically charged, it's very serious, you know, and, and this is just like, you know, if you, if you look at the antagonists of, of these two shows, you know, certainly there are some very, you know, dark antagonists in this, but like the tracksuit mafia, at times they they can be, you know, like the they can be intimidating, but a lot of the time they are very comical, and that works really well both in this miniseries and in the the Matt Fraction David Aha run, and that is something where really it works really well to bring in directors that handle this kind of lighter material. Now, quoting a few fellow critics, Hawkeye is not as ambitious as WandaVision, but it has a breezy quality that's easy to get into. Hawkeye is a nice return to Earth, after all the cosmic stuff we've seen lately is a reminder of why you fell in love with the Marvel Cinematic Universe in the first place. Acknowledging that the character is the least exciting Avenger can be fun in small doses, but it's not a thing to base an entire series on. I would... I'll just very briefly address, I agree that it, like, at times it is about how he's the least exciting Avenger. I wouldn't really say that it's something the entire series is based on. At, uh, at least I wouldn't, not him as the least exciting Avenger, more that he's sort of the most normal and human Avenger. That is definitely something that the entire series is about, that he's the most down-to-earth. I would say at least exciting, necessarily, but yeah. Back to quoting critics, its low-key vibe is precisely what makes it feel special. Hawkeye is modest in terms of threats and mythos, compared to its MCU Disney Plus predecessors, but it is nonetheless charming and full of heart. Now... So, moving on to the characters, I will just briefly start by saying the the tracks of Mafia at times serve as comic relief, and as such, some people will definitely feel that they're annoying, that the miniseries goes too far to get laughs out of them. So, Jeremy Renner as Clint Barton slash Hawkeye. I've personally never thought he was boring or a bad character, but he really shines here. A master, Wikipedia, a master archer and former Avenger and Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., the series further explores the, ser the character's time as Ronin, as first shown in Avengers Endgame. Renner said that meeting Kate Bishop brings an onsl onslaught of problems into Barton's life, as Barton does not understand her obsession with him. And... So yeah, quoting a fellow critic here, the show realizes that Clint is the least popular, least interesting Avenger, so episodes 1 and 2 focus more on Kate, who is a lot more interesting. There's a buddy cop dynamic where, you know, the, the two of them are very different from each other, and the miniseries deals with Clint's time as Ronin, which is the skeleton in his closet. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad this is a Disney Plus show and not a theatrical film because the stakes don't have to be the end of the world. I don't think Clint works well as someone who prevents the end of the world. I'm not saying he couldn't do that. I just don't think it's as interesting to, to see him do that. I, th I think it's more interesting to see these more sort of... Like, I, I would say some of the most compelling stuff that we've seen with the character so far was an endgame where he does save the world there at the end. But for some of his screen time, you know, he's going around, he's he's killing all these criminals because he lost everything. And he you know, that's that's how he responded to that. And you know, with when they're talking about they, they have to test the time travel you know, and they all realize, I mean, if this doesn't work, 
you might just you might be stuck in some other time period you you might never come back and without hesitation Clint says I'll do it because he has nothing left to lose and then they send him back to when his family was you know yeah before they were dusted and he almost you know talks to to one of his daughters and then they pull him back right before he does. You know, that's some of the most compelling. And I just, I, yeah, I really appreciate that they did this with him. I think his time as Ronan and his past are more interesting than the idea of him going out there and saving the world without any of the other Avengers. You know, I, I like seeing him save the world when he's part of the team. But on his own, I'm not saying he couldn't do it. He did, you know, he, he knocked Loki out of the, the flying chariot thing. You know, he took out a lot of robots in Age of Ultron. You know, he, he did a really good job, you know, keeping the, the gauntlet on the move during during Endgame. So he's he's been a huge part of saving the world. But when he's on his own... I like that he's just going up against these kind of buffoonish mafia henchmen. You know, that, that works really well. So, quoting Philip Pritiker, The whole show, show feels like a buddy cop adventure of the two, and it just works. Clint is the reluctant old person, while Kate is the wide-eyed, enthusiastic young one. Both of them go through great character developments as well. So, yeah. In, you know, Clint in New York, everyone is recognizing him. Many are starstruck, and he's very uncomfortable with it. And he is worried that some of his old Ronin enemies will realize the true identity of Ronin, is Clint Barton, and come after his family. And he's also trying to be the responsible adult, keeping Kate Bishop out of harm's way, because he realizes she's in over her head, which she doesn't realize. What she does realize, and he doesn't, is that with his mentorship, she could become good enough to be a hero. He's basically trying to protect her. She's too young, too inexperienced to do this. And that's, right, I should have, kind of, I'm talking about very early on, on the show. And Kate is like a surrogate daughter for Clint, and she brings his vulnerability and heart to the surface. He's usually not comfortable with a lot of attention. Now, you know, it's not that, like, his family also brings his heart to the surface, but usually that's when he's just alone with them, and this is him in a, you know, slightly more exposed situation, and there he usually is just, like, stone-faced, doesn't reveal if he is scared. And quoting fellow critics, Simply put, in just one episode, Hawkeye does more for the character than 10 years in the MCU has. By showing Clint away from Avengers' duties, Hawkeye has turned the character's weaknesses across the films, his normal scene of vulnerability, into his greatest assets. Clint Barton has not always been the easiest Avenger to rally behind, and Hawkeye doesn't look to make him more likable. It does double down on what makes Clint such an interesting paradox of a man. The PTSD that Clint went through in... Uh, Yeah, the, the PTSD that Clint is dealing with in this series, dealing with the loss of his best friend Natasha, confrontation with her loss, literally brought tears to my eyes. Every MCU fan must see this series, even if you don't particularly like the Hawkeye character. And, you know, I, I want to say it was Nando V. Movies, fellow YouTuber, who said that grief appears to be the main theme for Phase 4 of the MCU, and that is also very true of, of this show, and it does a really great job exploring that what grief does to you and how you sort of deal with you know you you see very clearly how Clint tries to to cope with having lost Natasha now this review gave it an 83 out of 100 Hawkeye manages to tell a story about the physical and mental wounds of Barton while still maintaining a spirit of festive joy and warmth he may be the last of the original Avengers to get its own story but Hawkeye makes it worth the wait now, uh, let's see, there was something I wanted to say here, let's see, um, 
Yeah, maybe I'll think of it later. That brings us to Haley Steinfeld as Kate Bishop, and again, Wikipedia, a 22-year-old Hawkeye fan who is Barton's protege and is being trained to take over the mantle of Hawkeye. She draws the attention of Barton by masquerading as Ronan. Steinfeld described Bishop as smart and witty and a badass with physical abilities that are through the roof, while Renner said she has a wonderful, annoying, and equally charming manner about her. And, you know, Wisecrack pointed out the face poor is about millennials, and I believe Kate is a millennial, and they, they do have some fun with that. Now, so, let's see this month. I guess, yeah, I believe this is a photo pretty. The first two episodes focus on Kate passing on the torch like the Black Widow solo movie, which for both is a disappointment for fans who waited 10 years for the character to get solo movie or solo project. Now, in interviews, the two of them have great chemistry, and they do on, on the show as well. Now, yeah, quoting fellow critic, the Hawkeye show is aware that... Oh, I accidentally put that two places. Never mind. Now, let's see. Yeah, so back to my own notes. Eleanor wants Kate to work for her in the long term, and Kate... Eleanor Bishop, Kate's mother, wants Kate to work for her in the long term, and Kate wants to prove that she doesn't need her rich family's help. She wants to prove that she can stand on her own, like in the comic, and... Like many rich kids, you know, she's, she's not ashamed of being rich, but she doesn't want it to define her, basically. And, you know, the, the two do have a good relationship, but it is one of those things, and, and, you know, Eleanor does try to support her, but it is one of those things where, you know, the mother feels like the daughter doesn't know enough about the world to completely understand all that she needs to and and she's she's worried about what will happen to Kate if she doesn't protect her and she there's a there's some some Eleanor hasn't always had the easiest life and she's she doesn't want Kate to have to go through a lot of hardship. Now, yeah, so both in the comic and in the show, Kate is young and inexperienced, but she does have incredible skills. At times, she displays more enthusiasm and youthful exuberance than cunning. She sometimes overestimates how well she can maneuver a situation and ends up in trouble. But she's also really good at making a solid recovery and getting back out of trouble, or at least getting into a situation where she doesn't need that much further help to get out of trouble. And she is incredibly insightful about Clint. She's not always the most responsible person, but she does acknowledge when she makes a mistake and tries to make amends. And I think that is very important. I think this character could have been incredibly obnoxious and and some people have found her incredibly obnoxious I, I saw at least a few I want to say Metacritic user reviews where some people really thought that she was way too annoying and I, I get that and and I I don't think that has like you know that obviously raises the question is that because they don't like female heroes young heroes I don't think I, th I think there are arguments that, you know, you, you can you can be against her character without being sexist or without thinking that young people can, you know, it doesn't mean you think very little of, of young people. But I do think they, they did a really, really good job just making sure, because there are, there are several times in the show where literally like someone will point out you did this this is a problem and it's something you did and instead of her getting defensive or la you know lashing out or something she you know she'll she'll basically 
admit, you know what, fair enough, my bad, and then she tries to do something to fix it. And, and that is the kind of thing, you know, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get right back to that in just a, a, but I have a few more things. A lot of people underestimate and disrespect her because of her youth and fairly obvious inexperience, but she knows how much she's capable of and deserving of respect for, and she doesn't just let other people treat her like crap. She is legitimately very insightful and a great communicator, good at getting others to communicate well as well. And yeah, you know, she has several traits that are stereotypically thought of as very typical for young women, especially, but they're positive stereotypes. You know, she, this is, this is one of those things for, for a long time. Yeah, just real quick. Everything I just said are are what I mean of, of positive stereotypes, you know. But for a while, if a f if a female character was a hero in something, you know, this isn't. Yeah, I suppose you could. Say, yeah, a Hollywood production. Then the woman would cease to be particularly feminine and start becoming very masculine and this isn't necessarily a bad thing but i do think that i, I don't think it's necessary to do that anymore it for a while it basically meant you know women had to prove that they could be as good at being men as men are and that means that women you know that that essentially defines womanhood and femininity as lesser that that means that they have to they have to suppress that to be impressive in an action movie and i think an argument could be made that for a while nothing else would have been accepted but we are now at a time you know yeah she can you know fire an arrow with incredible accuracy she can think of uh, think up a plan but she's not like this brooding cynical dark character at the same time is that she's still having fun and like you know being being enthusiastic and and such she's she's so happy to be doing this hero stuff and that's just like we we have it with spider-man it's not the she's not the only mcu character she's not the first mcu character but a lot of them treat it like a job and it's like even even you know Wanda who like I'm not sure we've been told exactly what age she's supposed was she supposed to be like 18 in in Age of Ultron I'm not 100% sure but yeah you know first scene of Civil War and she other than the flashback I mean and she's like treating it like a job you know she's she's taking it very seriously and yeah she makes a mistake definitely but she's not like and and I get, you know, it is a life or death situation. So I get why she's not like having fun with it. But yeah, you know, here we have a character who she's not like the, there there are times where we see like her her old bedroom. You know, she comes to visit her mom for Christmas in her mom's large house where she grew up. And we see her bedroom and, you know, it's it's one of those things where the parent has left it exactly as it was for you know from from childhood and yeah she she's been training to be good at archery since she was a child but she didn't stop being a girl you know she has like it yeah and and she's not ashamed of that you know when she meets clint she's she's you know, she she tries to not geek out too much, but she's not, like, trying to downplay her femininity. She never feels like she has to prove to him that a 22-year-old girl can be just as good as, I, I don't know, I would say, I'm guessing somewhere in his 40s, 30s or 40s, considering how long he's been doing this and how, like, he was, he was quite well-respected when he started out. You know, he must have been... 
he can't have been less than 20 when we first met him, so 30s at least, you know. Otherwise, like, there's no way that Nick Fury would trust him like he does. You know, he literally, early on in the first Avengers, he says, I put you on this assignment so you could keep an eye on things, you know. So that's a lot of trust for someone like Nick Fury. You know, I, I want to say, was it... Was it Mysterio who called him one of the most dangerous and... Right on the tip of my tongue. Paranoid people on Earth. You know, he might have said the most. Anyway, she doesn't feel the need to prove that she's good enough despite that. She, she realizes that he doesn't think... You know, at, at first he doesn't think she's good enough, but she doesn't, you know... And, and it, it is not like he, you know, he has daughters, he loves his wife, he's not sexist, he's just, like, he recognizes that she, you know, I, like I mentioned, she's trained in archery, she's also trained martial arts, but it was at, like, this, these private school, it, that kind of thing, so she has the ability, but she doesn't have the training outside, and, you know, the very first time that she engages in a martial arts fight in the real world she struggles with people who have had a lot more experience, who've, who've been in, like, regular fights a lot of times, and who fight dirty and that kind of thing. You know, she, she's having a little trouble keeping up with that. But, yeah, it's, it's not a... Ah, what's the word? It, yeah, it's, it's not that she she's not as good because she's a young woman it's that she's not as good because she needs more experience and she needs a mentor someone who has been in these real world conflicts and yeah i i really appreciate it. you know i i figure there's probably a lot of young women and even girls like literally you know i don't know nine-year-olds or something who watch this and think, well, I guess I could be, you know, that as, as well. And I, I really appreciate that. You know, with, with, in the second Thor movie, we have, you know, Natalie Portman, Natalie Portman's character, rather, at the end of the movie helps save the world, not because she punches people real hard or fires a gun or something, but because of her science you know, her, her knowledge and her, her ability to put, like, you know, it's, it's not just theoretical. She's, you know, she's doing these, she's making these portals appear and disappear because of how smart she is and how good she is at the science. You know, that encourages young women and, and girls and nine-year-olds to, to, you know, pursue science. And... You know, now we have, you know, I'm, I'm really glad we have that. I I don't think I'm the right person to, uh, to talk about which, if if we need more Jane Fosters or more Kate Bishops in the MCU, but I'm really glad we have both. Because again, like, for sure, I'm sure there are some young women, maybe even nine-year-old girls or whatever, who looked to Natasha and said, wow, she's badass. I want to grow up to be that. But again, like she, in a lot of ways, she is, you know, or was fairly masculine. You know, she, she beats up people. She fires guns. You know, there, there are a few times where, you know, for sure, you know, certainly there's, there's some feminine wiles. She tricks Loki. There's some, you know, she, she exploits that a lot of people look at femininity and think of it as weaker than masculinity. So, you know, that's how she tricks that, that Russian general into confessing, or confessing, uh, inter you know, she's interrogating him. And he thinks he's in control. He thinks that he has the power in the situation, but she only pretends to be captured you know she like she could basically have gotten out of it anytime she wanted and now that she knows barton is compromised she she gets out of it 
but with Kate, like, it really is, you know, she, like, there's a, there's this sort of training montage where she's, you know, Barton is teaching her something, and one of the times that she messes something up, instead of being like, I know I'm better than this, let me try again, instead, she, she laughs, because it's not that big of a deal. And that's the kind of thing that we really, you know, yeah. And, and uh, now that I've brought up the other ones, I will very briefly bring up, I guess I haven't talked that much about how Wanda, yeah, Wanda also a lot of the way fairly masculine, you know, she's, she kicks ass and, and such. Although the, f for sure, the, the, um, you know, WandaVision also explores her femininity, but but the that that leaves the the character of Carol Danvers. I hesitate to call her Captain Marvel because there's going to be more than one Captain Marvel in the next movie, if I recall, is is what it seems like. But yeah, Carol Danvers also, you know, she she's in a male or male-dominated field, the, this aircraft, you know, if Air Force pilot thing, and she has to prove that she's as good as the boys. So that's, again, this masculine thing. And I, I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, but I do think that we need more, you know, we need stuff that's also inviting to, to women to... to be feminine. And and it actually makes a lot of sense for this kind of thing of, you know, because archery, like, I'm not sure, is that really particularly seen as masculine? Because it's not like, like, punching people, that's seen as masculine, and firing a gun is seen as masculine. But a bow and arrow, that does require a lot of concentration and focus and patience and you know those are not always seen as the most masculine of traits it's seen as you know masculinity is often defined by this willingness to just jump directly into something now quoting fellow critics here Hawkeye works because of the chemistry between Renner and Steinfeld, but also because it prioritizes characters slightly more than action. Hawkeye rocks a great mix of playfulness and sense of danger. It's also hard to imagine better casting for Kate Bishop than Haley Steinfeld. Her timing and tone are always spot on, and her chemistry with Jeremy Renner is a major highlight. 4 out of 5. Yes, people can and will get hurt, but in a world where doom and gloom seem to be all over our media, Hawkeye uses the character's best superpower to save the day, heart. And sometimes that's all you need, B+. Steinfeld is a wonderful actress who has a knack of portraying intelligent, sarcastic, and athletic females, and Kate Bishop doesn't stay f stray far from that mold. I have to admit, I, I think this is the first thing I've ever seen her in. But I, I might have to check out at least some of her other stuff. She's so good in this show. 4.5 out of 5. Absolutely perfect in every way. This series is easily the best Marvel Disney Plus show yet. Haley Steinfeld embodies everything that Kate Bishop is and is the series standout. 5 out of 5. As a big fan of the Matt Fraction David Aha run, it's fantastic to see Lucky the Pizza Dog as the best doggo in the MCU, while Steinfeld is pitch perfect as Kate Bishop. 4 out of 5. Marvel Studios is once again slaying, as in Sansa's slay. Slay in it with Hawkeye, an unmissable Christmas time team up bringing holiday cheer to the MCU with top tier storytelling delivered in a mighty Marvel manner and a bold, brilliant new hero in Haley Steinfeld's Kate Bishop 5 out of 5. 75 out of 100. This adaptation of Aha and Fractions Hawkeye is smart, silly, and wonderfully shot, and it manages to reframe the worst Avenger in a way that works. Plus, it promises us a new generation of heroes who might just be able to be better than the ones who came before. And isn't that just what the world needs? And... Let's see. Yeah, so, one negative credit review. Disappointed. It tries to be funny, but it is mostly cheesy and groan-worthy, especially the caricatures of the Russian gangsters. 
creates a tonal dissonance with the rest of the show that's trying to be more serious. Worse, Haley is not cut out for this type of role. She's 25 in real life. Her character is supposed to be 22. Yet, she portrays a petulant teenager most of the time. Maybe this is her idea of pluck, but mostly she comes across as grating, arrogant, and entitled. She hams it up all the time and is barely watchable. And see, I don't particularly agree with any of that, but I can definitely see where they're coming from. And that is for sure how some people feel. And that's valid. And let's see, one more quick review. First of all, I like the chosen cast of the series. It's incredible how good the actor of Kate Bishop fits her role. The connection between Hawkeye and Kate Bishop was very well written, good structured, and they had a good chemistry all the way. And Vera Farmiga plays Eleanor Bishop, Kate's mother, and I don't have a lot to say that I didn't already say. I think... I'm not sure I would say her character was the best handled, but I do think there were definitely some good things there, and, you know, Vera Farmiga, I don't... I think if she was, like, literally sleepwalking, like, she fell asleep and she got up and started walking, and she, in her dream, thought she was someone else, even that would be a good performance. Like, I, I don't think she's capable of handing in a bad performance. I'm not sure if she's done roles like this, or, or I suppose, rather, done done shows similar to this, done, done stuff with tones similar to this. I don't know of it. I've, I know of her for, from more, like, serious stuff. Like, you know, The Departed, for example. And, you know, okay, so there's... The, the, I suppose, ah, it's right on the tip of my tongue, source code. Not the most serious thing in the world, but not as, like, quirky and, you know, lighthearted as this is. And, yeah, somehow she fits right in. Like, you, you'd think that she would feel completely out of place. And I think if you, if you look at her and you mostly think of, like, I, I'm not really familiar with them, but I think she's one of the leads in that series about the ghost hunters, the uh, Insidious, is that what they're called? Some, something like that. I, th I think you know what I mean. You know, if, if you look at her in, in the show and you're just constantly seeing that character, then obviously it's going to be really distracting. I do understand why she was attracted to the project. I do think there's something really interesting about her character. You know, she's not slumming it, is what I'm getting at. And let's see, I suppose... I don't know how much more I'm going to get into the characters... I have to briefly mention Alaqua Cox as Maya Lopez. She is... Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to talk that much about her character. I'm just going to say she's interesting. And she's actually... Her, her character is deaf. And she's the second deaf, uh, you know, major character in the MCU. The first being Makari, played by Lauren Ridloff in Eternals. Both of them are played by real-life deaf actors and non-white actors at that. And, you know, I want to say Lauren Ridloff is biracial, part African-American, part Mexican. And Alakwa Cox is Native American and deaf, just like her character Maya Lopez. And that's... I, I really appreciate that. I'm really glad that we're getting more inclusive in, in these. And, you know, for both deaf people and Native Americans, a lot of people think very little of them, but he or she is showing how much they can do. And, you know, it, it's like how Daredevil is blind. You know, sure, it's comic book exaggerated, but that doesn't mean that it can't be empowering. And she's like... I'm going to have to watch her in something else because she is so good in this. It is like she's she's one of the best in this. Like 
if you if you're really passionate about her character in the comics and you weren't really gonna watch this even though she's in it watch it just for her like seriously it's like that she is incredible in this show and just yeah it's it's so like there's there's such expressiveness that i i have to admit i'm not that familiar with deaf actors i, I haven't seen that much that features deaf actors I don't know. I yeah. I guess I did believe in this. This like, you know, there's a there's a stereotype that it that it's a huge hindrance when really it doesn't have to be. That depends on like your your strength of of character. And for sure, some people it is. I'm I'm not saying that it it's a matter. You know, not not everybody can be that. You know, but. Yeah, for, for some deaf people, it, it really doesn't, like, I mean, literally, we have here, she, she plays a, I suppose I'm not going to talk about how big of a role she plays in this, but she plays a role in this major Hollywood production that's, you know, watched by millions in, in this huge franchise, and she really is deaf, you know, and, yeah, you know, you, you, if you, if you watch like interviews with her she doesn't seem even the slightest bit she she doesn't come across as if she thinks of it as a disability at all it's just different you know it's it's not you know she she's aware that other people you know yeah you know other people aren't deaf but she doesn't think you know oh i'm i'm not as good as them you know and i yeah it's it's really cool and yeah the the how much she can express with the the sign language and body language and you know don't worry there are, there are subtitles there, there when when she says something when when she when she signs something she will it, it, what what the show will usually do is either have subtitles or have a character there to translate and yeah it it i i choose she's so good in this it's it's incredible and i suppose hmm yeah i'm this is kind of a uh somewhat of a spoiler but i do think it is worth briefly getting into so Spoilers for the show, until I, until you see the little man takes finger. Florence Pugh returns as Yelena Belova slash Black Widow from Wikipedia. A highly trained spy and assassin working for Valentina Allegra de Fontaine. Hunting Barton for his supposed role in her sister figure, Natasha Romanoff's death. Pugh said that Belova is continuing what she's good at. And despite her sister not being there, she's back working. Though her mission to hunt Barton sets up a whole different challenge. No more spoilers for the time being. And yeah, so Ava Russo, Ben Sakamoto, Kate, Cade Woodward reprise their respective roles as Barton's children, Lila Cooper and Nathaniel from prior MCU films, while Jolt, a golden retriever, plays with a cute pizza dog. The fictional Steve Rogers Captain America musical film within musical within the series. Rogers the Musical, a Hamilton, and Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, is, you know, send up, but there's there's definitely some, some passion for it. Sees stage actors portray Thor, Loki, Rogers, Bruce Banner, Slash Hulk, Barton, Romanoff, Tony Stark, Iron Man, and Chitauri Warriors. And Ant-Man, I guess the... Well, he wasn't there, as as Barton rightly points out. I guess that's why he's not listed there. Now, this does a really good job of picking up at like when the the uh, when we you know Barton was grieving Natasha at the end of Endgame, which is when we last saw him. And, ah, what's the word? You know, ba basically trying to come to terms with, you know, and ha happy to have his family back. 
and that is where we pick up here. He is still like he's he's grieving her, but he's also trying to be a good father and and his kids clearly do really love him. And that also really makes you you know you really badly want him to be able to get home in time for Christmas. He you know, he sends the the kids home when he realizes that there's something he has to deal with in New York and Lila is like should we be worried and you know she can tell there's something going on but you know and and the um, yeah they they go home to their mother on the farm now so quoting critics too much of the show passes before we meet the main villain, and that's a bit of a problem for the show. Hawkeye episodes 1 and 2 are an awesome blend of the Matt Fraction David Aha series and Christmas. Fans of Clint Barton getting the character they've been waiting for in live action, and Kate Bishop is going to be everyone's new favorite hero. 9.5 out of 10. When it focuses on its leads, it has the potential to be relatively diverting if airless. A relatively diverting if earliest chapter of the Marvel Universe, one unfettered thus far by the weight of Phase 4's multiverse Mich Michigas, I guess. As I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Yiddish. I forgot to look up the pronunciation. And yeah, it's very true. This is... I, I wouldn't go quite as far as to say that... Uh, what was the... Airless. I, I wouldn't go quite that far. But for sure, you know, we've gone pretty hard and and heavy and deep on that I should have thought more about how I phrased that before I started saying it but phase four has been very like it's it's not super accessible if you're not like if you're not already pretty deep into the you know for a while it seems like Shang-Chi is like oh okay you Shang-Chi you can go into that without knowing the rest of the MCU but it doesn't stay like super like casual as a you know it goes pretty deep and and gets very complicated and and fantastical you know so yeah th this is definitely th this is sort of reassuring the audience if if you're not loving how how like fantastical this is this the MCU has been recently. Don't worry, there is still you know there will still be things for you. You know that's that's another thing. Black Widow, as as dark and unpleasant as it gets about these you know abused young women, that also has you know for a, for a while it seems like okay this you know this is this is a spy film. You know you don't you don't have to like be all about the multiverse and and all this you know co and cosmic and such but then by the end you know i, I recently heard I, I forget which youtuber but one youtuber said it you know the end oh it might have been it might have been sean chandler talks about you know the ending it's it's a video game level you know flying castle in the sky and have to dodge things as you know we we you know as as yeah, Natasha has to dodge things while falling out of the sky and this whole thing. You know, it's we, we can't really relate to it anymore. You know, I it's it's not necessarily bad, but it is it's it's definitely not what everybody wants out of these movies. It's just something that the MCU has trouble you know, there is there is clearly some some worry that if an MCU movie ends without a huge CGI What's the word? CGI climax. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe people won't like it as much. Maybe it won't make as much money, you know, and yeah, it just it It's it's really nice to have something that's smaller scale. And it it it's is that a spoiler? Okay. Technically this I suppose this is kind of a spoiler. This show never gets just completely crazy and just, you know, end of the world and army of, of robots, you know, it, it cosmic, none of that. It, it never gets completely out of control. 
no more spoilers for the time being. Back to quoting fellow critics. Hawkeye's aim isn't completely true, but it doesn't prevent the mismatched duo at its heart from being a real delight. 7 out of 10. Steinfeld and Renner are good falls for each other as Bishop pushes Barton to relax, and he tends to her like a fuzzy ant. Yeah. Did I say fussy, not fuzzy? Although that would also be an interesting series. Hawkeye does just as wonderful of a job exploring Kate Bishop as it does the, uh, hero, the title hero himself. This cheerful and action-packed series is off to a good start. It starts off a little slow and seems lower budget than previous Marvel Disney Plus shows. But Renner and Seinfeld are both super charismatic. The show is a lot of fun. Hawkeye is, phenomenal, is a phenomenal entry into the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the perfect showcase for Jeremy Renner to finally give us the full Clint Barton experience, aided by a show-stopping performance from Haley Steinfeld as Kate Bishop. 9 out of 10. Uh, I'm going to take a very brief break and say there, there are other characters who have really compelling relationships with each other in this show, and some of them, you know, not, not all of them, are equally well, like... So, yeah, some some of them are better than others, better handled than others, but yeah, I, I would say every major character has a compelling relationship with at least one other character who has a good amount of screen time. None of them are just completely alone and have nothing, and, and in these relationships, you know, it, in a comic book, if you have a character and you have a lot of information to, to get across, you can just have, you know, box after box of expository, you know, it, it used to be that the first time you met a villain, you would get a huge info dump about their backstory, you know. But it might not always be the very first time you meet them, but, you know, when you learn their backstory, you can, you know, it can be pages of pages, page after page of just a lot of information about, you know, the character started as this, and then this happened, and now they, you know, now they have the power to do this or that, and you know, and that works well for a comic book, which, to reiterate, is a medium I love, but it doesn't translate that well to movies, and that's where some adaptations have had some problems. You know, I, I'm not sure I would say. I, I think the first 300 movie might be the only time that I really felt that just, you know, box after box of just basically narration worked well in an actual live-action movie. I, I I haven't watched that many of the animated adaptations, so it's possible that those also do well. But it's difficult to get it to work in live-action, and this show has the characters having conversations with other characters, and that's how we, you know, and yeah, sometimes it's this thing of, like, both characters already know this information. They don't do that. They don't do that too much in, in the show. But, yeah, you know, it's it's just, it's more interesting to see. Because it's, it's, and it feels more real somehow, which is, you know, as, as ground level as this is, this is still the MCU. So real is never going to be completely, you know, it's not, it's not like this show pretends like the Avengers don't exist. It's just, you know. Hawkeye is away from the Avengers for Christmas, but, you know, but, yeah, the, the characters, you know, you, you just, you are, when, when you are talking with one other person, and it's a person who knows you well, or understands you well, that just gets you to reveal parts of yourself that, you know, you don't show when you're surrounded by people. You know, and yeah, the show does a good job with with that. Back to quoting critics, Hawkeye finally gets his time to shine in this immensely fun series. Kate Bishop is also a very well developed new addition to the MCU. Well developed new addition to the MCU. The dynamic between Clint and Kate is enough on its own to keep me intrigued for all six episodes. Hawkeye has always been one of my favorite characters in Marvel comics, and while he does not glisten in the sunlight expected on the show. The show is a lot of fun and builds Clint Barton's character from the amount we've seen him in the other films in this franchise. In The Avengers, we know nothing about him except that he's really good at what he does and he's under mind control for half the movie. In AOU, we learn that he's a family man. In Endgame, we see his reaction to the snap 
how it changes him and continues to follow him into this series. The action scenes are pretty great and we're shown how all this action has affected him over the course of the five movies he's appeared in. I like how they mixed in his hearing deficiency with Maya and how they incorporated Alaka Cox's disabilities into the character, showing her true strength. Haley Steinfeld is so likable as Kate Bishop and she, play she plays it perfectly with a new take on the character. I feel so biased to most of the MCU, but I really liked this show. I'll be glad to see what they plan for Echo and that is why I should stop that sentence. The strongest part of this series was the performances chemistry between Jeremy Renner and Haley Steinfeld. Haley Steinfeld's character is a great addition to the MCU, and I'm excited to see where she goes next. And Renner was a lot of fun to watch. It was nice getting a small scale Hawkeye centric story. And yeah, so I've already talked some about the diversity, and yeah, I, just, I really appreciate, you know. When if if you go back to the the original comics, you know a lot of the characters were were male. They were they tended to be white, and you know I I really appreciate that we are now celebrating the diversity found in real life instead of this. Yeah. Now diversity in casting is one thing, but you know not not all fiction that that casts diversity diverse that has diversity in their casting actually understands the unique perspectives of its minority characters now i would definitely say that this does understand you know what it's like to be a young woman what it's like to be deaf what it's like to be native american i would say the the eastern european characters tend to be played for laughs this is not really somewhere to you know, don't don't look to this for for accurate representation there. And I do, I think it made a lot of sense considering the comic. But I do, you know, it is necessary to also have positive representation for for Eastern European. It's, you know, there's been so much negative representation, and I will grant that during the Cold War, it, you know, there was a concern in the West here in the West that you know the eastern bloc would become a huge problem and thus it does make a lot of sense to go and and say well you know we if we depict them negatively then people won't be as willing to entertain their ideas you know but i mean we really don't need to to do that kind of thing anymore you know so yeah The dialogue is great. There's a lot of wit, and the the quirk is expressed well through the dialogue. And the some some of the characters we see in tremendously varied circumstances. So we see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong, and does does good job characterizing them. You know when when. I, I'm not sure I want to give too much away about Kate. I, I, I would say, I, yeah, from early on we see that Kate tries to find a solution when she's faced with problems. She doesn't, she doesn't get frustrated, she doesn't run away, she tries to find a solution. She's not always, you know, some, sometimes she needs some help and she's not... Hmm. Actually, yeah, she it 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 varies. Sometimes she is really good at at knowing at least who to ask for help. And yeah. So, on Metacritic, this has a 66 out of 100, 6.8 out of 10 users for yeah, user rating. 92% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 90% user rating on Rotten Tomatoes. So the cinematography was handled by James Whitaker, who was the cinematography on 14 movies, and I want to say at least one of them was the movie. Yeah, at least one movie that 
Bert and Bertie directed, so you know they've worked together before. Let's see. Eric Stielberg, who was a cinematographer on 23 short films, and let's see, what does this say? 19 movies. Some of them very well known. Including Ghostbusters Afterlife, which I admit I have not watched, but that, you know, based on trailers and the first two movies, I haven't watched the uh, female. Uh, maybe, maybe I will at some point. The 20, I want to say 2016 female led ghost. I don't have any issue with gender swapping the Ghostbusters. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to watch any of the newer. Ghostbusters movies. I'm, I'm not that passionate about the old ones, so it's just, you know, I've I've watched the first two. I think the both of the movies have some some real strengths. Yes, including the second one. I'm I'm not sure I'm gonna watch the new ones, but based on the first two Ghostbusters movies and the trailer for the trailers for Ghostbusters Afterlife, it does seem like that also has this kind of. You know, you, you have fairly normal people having to deal with something. And, you know, you have family stuff. You have quirky comedy. Yeah. And action. So, it does make a lot of sense. for. Now, yes, yeah, so the, the cinematography is really good on, on this. There's you know occasionally gets you know, a, a lot of the time it's not that like it's not super creative but occasionally it will get very creative there's this car chase where they have this really long take that feels some, like right out of a Brian De Palma movie or it was very likely inspired by Tr Children of Men and yeah just the the you know, the cinematography does a really great job keeping the energy going in action scenes and such, never getting boring, and keeping things more calm when it's just a conversation. And the editing was handled by Ian McLaren. Let's see. Lily Henry. Seven Mardi Rossian I did not need to copy in everything that they did. There we go. And they do a, a quite good job. The yeah, the the editing tends to keep. I, yeah, I don't think there was a single action scene where I just lost track of of stuff. That's you know, I mean the the moment that you have like there there are you know fighting scenes and such in this, but there's also several scenes. There's a, a number of scenes where characters fire arrows, and that kind of means that the the editing needs to make it clear who's firing, what are they firing, who are they firing at what happens when they hit considering it's trick arrows and then not losing track you know you you can't spend too long on on all of that before you have to go back to the character to to keep the momentum going editing action scenes is, is a challenge and yeah the the show does a really great job i have seen some criticize the editing during certain dialogue scenes there is definitely there, there so at, at times, that could be better, yes. The special effects are pretty good. There are a couple of times where it's like, okay, that is definitely CGI. And the stunt work is really, really good. Like, during fight scenes and such. It, it really feels, you know, the, the, like, stunt work for an action scene, you have to make it look 
like it hurts without hurting anyone. And that's like, you know, we are thankfully well past the point where it was okay to actually risk badly injuring people for action scenes. And yeah, they, they do a really good job. Now, the action is intense, cool, funny, not as big as we're used to from the MCU since, you know, that would not fit the street level, and I'm really glad it was the right decision. And, yeah, we have chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, martial arts, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles, and lots and lots of trig arrows. And, yeah, so... Quoting one fellow critic here, it's clear Haley is not a natural when it comes to the fight choreography. And the quick cuts and edits gave me terrible Iron Fist flashbacks. So if this is something that bothered you, take this as a warning. And right, so the score, I think I did I forget to copy it in or did I just not find a person yeah I had a little trouble finding if if I recall was it the edit actually I might be thinking of a different show anyway the music I'm gonna quote a fellow critic here the music score is also fine for the most part but the use of Christmas music is utilized well yeah it uses some like licensed music really really well there's also there's a bit during the the car chase I've mentioned just such good use of music and it's basically like it's the uh, what's the word it's that thing of like the radio is playing music so so you know what, what's the term diegetic in in the scene you know and yeah it, it works really really well right this is the part of the video where I get into I, I have to admit, I am a little surprised to twice in one year, when talking about MCU, be talking about musical scenes, but music, musical numbers. But yeah, here we are again. It's, it's very good. They do a really good job at making it like, it, it's clearly supposed to be kind of like, goofy and and like overdone like it's it's you know the the audience in the show watching the show watching the musical number clearly think it's ridiculous and the audience we we the you know the real life audience we are clearly also supposed to think that it's difficult to do that well with that you know you, you have to you have to find a good balance between making it clear, okay, this is this is kind of this is a little bad, without also making the music and dancing bad, because that's just uncomfortable to watch. You know, then we get into like bad comedy territory. I I forget, I want to say it's maybe Obscurus Lupa who said that the worst thing to watch is a bad com a failed comedy. You know, a, a comedy that just is not funny. It's just it's it's like cringe inducing it's it's painful it it can be literally physical painful to watch because you just you know i mean your your body is essentially saying nope this is bad this is this this might be poisonous to you and that's obviously the lizard brain not appreciating musical theater but no like and and comedy but yeah you know that is that is and they they strike that balance it is legitimately like the yeah, it's not a spoiler to say the musical number we only see it very briefly in in the first episode, but it is there as a post. We get more of it as a post credit scene in you know in in one of the episodes, and then it doesn't cut to audience reactions. It's just focusing on the show. It'll occasionally cut to like orchestrator or or whatever it's called. You know, with the little stick thing, it's, you know, that kind of thing. But the, but otherwise, it's just showing these, you know, very talented performers, you know, singing and dancing, and 
yeah, it's not a spoiler to say it's it's the it's the climax of the first Avengers movie. So, you know, you have some civilians singing about how they need help, and then in come the Avengers, and all of them get like you know a little bit to to show off what they can do, kind of thing. And yeah, it is like you know you you watch and it's like okay, this is this is pretty silly. This is you know I get that you you wanna you wanna do a tribute to them. You're grateful, obviously, but this is kind of silly balances that with like well, that's actually pretty decent choreography good good dancing good singing you know and yeah the sound design is great this is one of those you know i i like to occasionally talk about we take sound design for granted a lot of the time because we we see the thing that causes the sound then we hear the sound and we just think oh yeah that thing makes that noise but in real life trick arrows don't really that's that's not really a thing you know certainly not to the extent that clint barton uses so every single time there's one of those you know someone had to go and like put together the the audio for what it should sound like you know they they might be able to get like real audio of like the the ah what's it called when you when you release the the bow string and the an an arrow flying through the sky you might be able to get that properly but the moment that this trick arrow you know opens up to something or explodes or something well okay explosion also can be replicated but a lot of the effects of trick arrows don't exist in real life, or at least, or don't act like that, or, you know, various. And they have to go and create that, and I, I don't think there was a single trick arrow where I was like, I eh, shouldn't make that noise. And the, so yeah, I've, I've talked a little bit about the, the comedy. So yeah, it, it is mostly quirk, some wit, like characters will make will will like crack jokes, be sarcastic and such, and yeah, you know the the timing, the material, the the skill level. You know some of it really uses reaction shots. It's it's pretty good. It's not the the best thing ever, and and certainly some people really couldn't stand it, and I I get that, and and certainly like if you go into this and you don't already. You know, if, yeah, if you go into this and you haven't watched the trailers, you haven't read the Man Fraction David Aha run, for sure, you know, for some, some people found that it was too too different from regular MC. Like, it's, it's yeah, the, the, it's, it's quirkier and lighter than, you know, a lot of the MCU. A, a lot of the MCU is very serious and, and heavy. Okay, maybe not. Maybe not a lot of it heavy, but a lot of it is fairly serious. You know, you'll it'll have there'll be jokes in there, but they'll be dealing with serious topics. You know, terrorism, PTSD. But yeah, if you if you go into this not knowing that it's going to be like you know, it might be a little much for you for sure. Now talking about the tone, so from Wikipedia. The teaser trailer was released on September 13th, 2021. And see, Mathai at uh, Slash Film, I guess, said everything in the teaser looked shockingly delightful from the laid back comedic tone to the chemistry between Steinfeld and Renner. He was enthused about the low stakes of the series story with Barton trying to get home for Christmas. I'm gonna go with a guess here and say that that's pronounced Heim Garzenberg of The Verge was drawn to the teaser's surprisingly light tone and felt the series would draw elements from the Christmas films Home Alone and Die Hard. Yes, and it works really well. Enemies Sam... Sam Warner described the teaser as a festive first look at the series and noted the use of the song It's the Most Wonderful Time of Year. There we go, better. Steven Irvolino of Good Morning America said the teaser was a blend of action humor and downright 007 looking spy scenes. That is also true. 
Ryan Parker, writing for The Hollywood Reporter, noted the unique tone of the teaser that presented the series as more of a comedy holiday romp, albeit with a, lot, with a ton of action. Entertainment Weekly's Christian Holub felt the Christmas setting added a home alone like vibe to the series and noted the teaser's many references to the comics, particularly Fraction's Run. And, yeah, very quirky. People on both sides have normal human problems. Now, let's see what's that. Right. So, quoting fellow critic, 3 out of 10. If it was more clearly marketed as a kid's show or as a show about Kate, I'd give it more leeway, but I expected a good Marvel show that adults can watch and instead got a CW teen show with better production values. It's a sitcom without a laugh track, with terribly cheesy one-liners machine-gunned in every scene. Everyone has a snarky Reddit-level joke, even when they have a gun to their head. I wouldn't go quite that far, but I can understand and appreciate their perspective, and for sure it is not going to be for everyone. And CW, I mean... Maybe, yeah, somewhat. I, I see what they mean, for sure. So, pacing. I'm going to briefly go over the other Disney Plus MCU shows. WandaVision took a while to reveal very much of the main mystery. Personally, I was very happy with all the red herrings, but I understand not everyone was. But at least it did have red herrings, where Loki Season 1 had almost no main mystery stuff. Captain America the Winter Soldier had long and the Winter Soldier had long chunks where very little would happen. It was just people talking. Again, I loved it, but for sure, it, you know, pacing-wise, yeah. There would be at least one of these in every episode of just people talking. Loki Season 1 was very slow in its slow drip feed of information about the main mystery, frustratingly slow to the point where it felt like absolutely nothing was happening there. What if is fast-paced, sometimes too fast. I used to say it was a good thing for these Disney Plus shows that, unlike the 22-episode per season, 42-minute episodes that would air on TV, before the Disney Plus shows, before the Disney Plus shows, the Disney Plus shows did not have to fight for our attention by having something dramatic at the end of every seven minutes when there would be an ad break, since something you're watching that's being transmitted at that time for the first time on TV has rivals on other networks at that same time. For Disney Plus shows, you can watch anytime once the episode is on Disney Plus. But now I'm starting to wonder if maybe it would have been better for these shows. So I wondered if this would be the first Disney Plus MCU show where you cannot fault the pacing. It is not always great. Some episodes definitely meander, and yeah, it, the the main thrust of the the mystery and and the, the yeah the core plot sometimes needed a little bit more. Like there are a number of scenes where it doesn't feel like they're making that much progress. Or even especially trying to, and it's not, again, I'm not, I wasn't expecting this to be like the rest of the MCU, but the, the two pilot episodes set this up as being about the, the, the two, you know, Kate Bishop and Clint Barton working together and trying to solve this murder mystery and getting to the bottom of what's going on and you know who's behind it in this whole thing and yeah there are a number of, of scenes where it they're not really making progress and it doesn't feel like they're really trying to make progress and it like they're basically they're not really acting like there is a murder mystery you know the like there's a there's a murderer somewhere out there and that's yeah some you know I, I get you know quirky and lighter and such, but they did choose to make it a murder mystery, which, you know, the comics, a, a different, a, you know, yeah, the comics not, are, are not really about a murder mystery. There are mysteries in some of the issues, but usually the mystery will be dealt with, you know, either in that same issue, or it certainly won't be like, stretched out over you know here we do have a murder mystery stretched out over these six episodes and I, I don't know maybe maybe the murder mystery should have been introduced a little bit later in in the show and they, it's a good hook you know the moment that you know there's a murderer out there 
like, and, and it's different. I'm not sure we've had any other murder mysteries in the MCU. So, but, but it just, it feels like they maybe didn't have quite enough material to make it deeply compelling for all six episodes. I, I wouldn't say that the show should be shorter than six episodes, but I do think maybe the murder mystery should have happened a little further into the show. The, the murder that they're trying to solve should have happened a little later into the show. Now, there is only one season of the show, and that season is comprised of six episodes. Now, combined, without end credits, it comes to four hours and one minute. And episode six has a post credit scene. It's the musical number that I mentioned before. And there are definitely some great visual end credits and opening credit sequences. They don't add a lot of screen time. Other than that, you know, you can just skip the, the credits. And, yeah, I, I think, you know, it is worth that investment of time. And, like, I would say... If you're not loving episode one, try to at least give it to the end of episode two. If you're not, if if by the end of episode two you don't care about the story threads, then you probably, I'm, I'm not sure you're especially going to, but if by the end of episode two you feel like, okay, the pacing is still really slow, it's, the plot is meandering, try to give it to the end of episode three. If you still, by the end of episode three, you're not, you know, you're not really, really gripped and really wanting to see the next, then I'm not sure that it's it's worth it for you to watch the last three episodes, even though you, by that point, be halfway through the show. But, yeah, I I wouldn't say that it feels much longer or shorter than it actually is, and it's not really the kind of thing where you fast-forward through or only watch certain parts. I don't especially wish that it was longer or shorter. I think it's the right length. I do think that there are a couple of scenes that should have been made a little more focused. I suppose it's ultimately maybe an editing, maybe also a directing. Like the 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 actors needed to be needed to come across as a little more scared and and worried about what's going on. And the scenes need to just trim a little, tighten up a little bit, and make it move a little faster. That's that's pretty much it. Now, let's see, that is... Right, so, I would say the best element is Kate Bishop and the way she interacts with the rest of the world tied with the exploration of Clint's, you know, Clint's past and his time as Ronan and this sort of, and, and grief, him grief, and hero worship. Yeah, okay. Yeah, tied between those four elements. It's like, if you've read the comics and you like Kate Bishop, this is definitely something that you're going to enjoy. Like, if I, hypothetically, if I had read the, the, you know, let's say someone had recommended me the David Aha, the Matt Fraction David Aha run on Hawkeye, and just said, you got to read it. And I didn't know that a Hawkeye miniseries was coming out. And I, yeah, I just read it. I would definitely really badly want for Kate Bishop to show up you know, in, in the MCU soon. And I would, you know, would I have been even more excited than when I found out this was... I'm not sure that was possible. I've, I've been wanting a Hawkeye solo thing for years. And, like, I really love the inclusivity and diversity here. So, yeah. And, and just the idea of mixing... Home Alone, Die Hard, the MCU, and, uh, yeah, th th this mix I, I really love. Now, the worst aspect. I suppose, yeah, if I have to be brutally honest, the, the, um, there are definitely things that seem like a big deal in early episodes that 
ultimately get resolved a little too easily and not the, the most satisfying way. But I, I don't think it's a really big deal, though. Now, the thing I was most worried about was probably that Kate was going to be very toned down, going to be kind of bland, boring. Like, I personally do like Carol Danvers, but she definitely doesn't have as much personality as, you know, like... Part of the reason that the Captain Marvel movie came out when it did was because the DCU put out a Wonder Woman solo movie. And in a way, it's not quite fair because the one, you know, Wonder Woman, if you get her character right, is just so uplifting and charismatic and, and just, you know, you just, you love to see it. And I don't, I've never had a problem with Carol Danvers. I, I suppose I haven't, read that many comics that she appears in but yeah I've never had a problem with her I thought she was an interesting character even though for a while she I, I don't know she was maybe a little too defined by the trauma she had felt there wasn't as much like outside of that but yeah you know she's, she's a compelling character and I suppose it's also the you know the fact that like when I read the comics the, a really big thing was she lost her powers because Rogue, you know, took, took them from her. And so she's really defined by that trauma, and that hasn't happened in the MCU. That it might, you know, they, they do now have the, the rights to the character of Rogue. I, I think that she could have been a more, you know, like there's that, there's that brief flashback where she's like rocking it out to, um, karaoke you know she she clearly had a personality but that was before the whole brainwashing Cree thing so yeah you know and and like then end game she's stoic and has a lot of confidence I love her confidence but she doesn't have that much personality and it's just yeah I'm I'm really glad that they didn't that Kate Bishop has as much personality as she has and I am so glad she's part of the MCU. I'm so glad that this is just her introduction. She's going to appear down the line. You know, she's going to be a young Avenger. So, yeah, I was, I was most worried that they were really going to tone down Kate Bishop, and I'm really glad they didn't. My the the show really exceeded my expectations. Now, yeah, I was most looking forward to. I suppose, um, actually, yeah, the things I was most looking forward to were the things that ended up being the best elements. So, yeah, it exceeded my expectations. Now, so yeah, I already, I talked about that the, you know, the pilot, good, not great. The finale, good, not great. The overall season, also good, not great. There were definitely some 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 really great episodes in there. I would expect, you know, like, I suppose I have to admit, I, I will very, I'll be quick and nimble, but I will just have to very briefly look up so that I don't end up mixing up some of the episodes for each other. Okay, here we go. And, okay, so, I would say episode three was definitely a, yeah. Actually, I suppose three, four, and five might have been the ones that I thought most highly of. Now, the trailers do give away too much. 
and that's, you know, yeah, by now we're kind of used to that. I think every single trailer gives away at least a little bit too much, but the trailers do also give you a really good idea of what the miniseries is like. If you like the trailer, you're likely to like the mini series. And, I mean, yeah, the, the sort of, I'm not 100% certain, is it called a cover or a poster? Because it's not like a physical, you know, if, if you look up the show on Disney Plus or IMDb, yeah, some of, some of those do give a little too much away, but again, they give you a good idea of what it is like. And so yeah, and as usual, you know, MCU PG thirteen, it's not especially violent, gory, or set or you know, there's you know, almost no sexual material and such. There are a couple of disturbing things, you know, the, the, they, they do push the PG-13, but yeah, it's, it's not that dark or like, yeah. Now, and if you have made it this far without knowing very much about, you know, Disney Plus as a streaming service, you know, this particular thing has, like, the, the one extra, the uh, extra special feature that it had when I, when I last checked, which was, like, yesterday, was a gag reel, which, it's, it's fine, it's, it's charming, it's not the most hilarious thing ever, but, you know, G gag reels can be very humanizing it's very humanizing and yeah that's that's technically the only extra the only special feature but it does have every mcu movie other than the spider-man solo ones and i don't think there's a single mcu movie that has just like nothing most of them have good stuff and some have a lot so yeah if you if you don't have Disney Plus yet, but you like the MCU, it's a good, you know, it it has stuff that I haven't seen on DVDs that, I, at least from the library, I suppose that's not, some, some of it might also be on home releases, but it does have stuff that appears to be completely unique to Disney Plus. Now, I give this 10 arrows fired, hitting the bullseye out of 10, and yeah, it's... I hope I've either convinced you to watch the show or, you know, if you've watched this video up to this point and you're like, okay, the show is not for me, that's fine too. I, I don't want someone to watch one of my videos and then, you know, think that they're going to really enjoy it and then end up feeling like they wasted their time watching the thing. So that is it for this video. So if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on the movie, and recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.